Stay up to date with LN247. LN with news, politics, business, sports, and more on LN247, where the story goes, we go. Africa's demographic dividend holds the key to its economic transformation. Demographic dividend being the potential for accelerated economic growth when the proportion of the population that is of working age exceeds the proportion of the population that doesn't work. Yet that dividend could be under threat from brain drain. Immigration of skilled nationals results in the depletion of skilled human resources on the continent, leaving it vulnerable and underdeveloped. The African Union estimates that about 70,000 skilled professionals immigrate from Africa every year. Currently, Africa is the world's youngest continent, with an estimated 10 to 12 million young Africans joining the labor force each year. Yet the continent is able to create only 3 million jobs annually. With limited economic opportunities, many young Africans are migrating to Europe and America for economic opportunities. At the start of 2019, there were 68 million children aged less than 15 years in the EU27, compared with 91 million older people. A lower number of working age people leading to a reduction in revenue raising powers. This means that Africa's loss is a gain of these countries whose economies are boosted by Africa's young professionals. In Nigeria's medical sector alone, over 1,400 doctors left the country in 2023 and 42,000 nurses have left leaving its health sector vulnerable. Is Africa's useful demographic being exploited and to what end? by richer Western countries. And what does this phenomenon of economic migration portend for the continent? Welcome to the agenda. My name is Henry Williams and on today's program, a talking point will be, does Africa's population pose a threat to the West? Also, we'll be looking at our Western policies driving economic migration. And finally, we will be examining Africa's youthful demographic edge. Is there actually an edge? We are bound to find out. Now, don't forget, you can join the conversation by sending your messages and contributions on various platforms, including King's Chat, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and X. Well, it's great to be here once more on another experience talking about situations on the continent where do we go in Africa today? Well, stay with us as we, in, as we um, welcome our guest joining us on today's edition of the program, President and Founder of Africa Diaspora Development Institute's ADDI, Her Excellency Dr. Arikana Chimombori Kwa. Dr. Chimombori Kwa is a medical doctor, public speaker, pan-Africanist, educator, and diplomat and up till 2019, she was the permanent representative of the AU to the United States. Our speeches, at, uh, our speeches across the globe have provoked belief in African Renaissance in many of today's young Africans, earning her the name Mama Africa by her admirers, reminiscent the late icon of African music and activist, Miriam Makeba. Your Excellency, welcome to the agenda. It's great to have you on today's program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, finally, um, the last time we had you on the agenda, we're talking about issues of rising coups on the continent. 
and also elections in Zimbabwe. This time around, uh, while those issues still linger, uh, other issues have cropped up as well and uh, really draw our attention. You know, uh, looking at what is de bedeviling the continent today, beyond mature resource is a burgeoning army of youths currently in Africa. And, and well, Africa has earned the, the rights to say it is the world's youngest continent with an estimated 10 to 12 million young Africans joining the labor force each year. But there is a threat to this demographic, uh, which is brain drain or economic migration. Can you speak to this, Your Excellency? Very much, my son, for having me again. And also, let me just congratulate you for the continued good work that you are doing on the continent, spreading the news and uh, keeping us informed about what is really happening in our world. The issue of migration is nothing new. As Africans, we have been migrating uh, for centuries. In fact, the diversity of experience as the African continent comes from centuries of migration. So I have really nothing against migration. The question really becomes, as African leadership, are we prepared to create an environment that when the Africans do migrate, whether they are migrating within the country, migrating region, migrating within the continent, migrating outside the continent. We know for a fact, there is nothing to do to prevent people from migrating. So forget that part. Let's be prepared to say people will a young man in Botswana may not find something for himself in Botswana, but there's an opportunity for his abilities in Zimbabwe. And the true, the reverse is true. We created that environment that allows that free movement of people, that when they migrate within the continent, we're prepared to receive them. To me, that's where I find the biggest challenge in the sense that Berlin Conference remains alive and well. As long as we are going to continue to be protective of our borders within Africa, as long as we are not prepared to open Africa to the Africans, every little bit of the economy are going to struggle to survive, are going to struggle to build their economy is to the level that every one of their citizens can live a better life that they were brought on this earth to enjoy. That is the problem that I see. Africa is not prepared to open its borders so the children of Africa can migrate like we have done for centuries. That wherein lies the problem. So even if you be a leader, if you were to take every sector of development, Let's take agriculture, for example. You could start by saying, why aren't we producing? We have the most arable land in the world, or well, then they will throw in economies and, and in politics and economic development. Well, there's not enough infrastructure, so we can have a whole conversation on that. Then others will come up with of power supply, another whole conversation on that. We can come in and say they will access, another whole conversation on that. This is all just one sector. But at the end of the day, our ability to deliver on all the basics for us to enjoy agriculture like we should and be the breadbasket of the world like we should, it goes back to if you were to peel these layers of this onion, to the core of it, there are some pillars that must be addressed. The question is, do we understand pillars. Do we understand that issues are at the core of Africa's development? Wherein lies the challenge. We must understand our Africa, the core. Let's peel each layer of this onion, understand it, strategize it at that level, but realizing that our ability to deliver on infrastructure, our ability 
to deliver on power supply, our ability to deliver on market access is hindered when it's all said and done. The global policies that are, that are affecting us as African nations and as African general. The solution, in my humble opinion, is an Africa that is united, an Africa that is going to open its borders and stop being so restrictive. That way, Africa cannot move around and grow. Africa must open now. Africa must speak with one voice, one Africa, one voice, one continent, one economy. That's what it's going to take. Your Excellency, uh, indeed, uh, you do make a case for the opening of Africa's borders, softening of borders and allowing movement of people within the continent. That still remains a pipe dream. But uh, from the other side, looking at the situation on ground, it does call to mind um, the question of the, the drivers of, of this migration, the economic downturn, bad governance, corruption, and all of that seems to drive nine, uh, Africa's best minds out of the continent. And one would wonder if the borders were softened, where would they go within the continent when the, the El Dorado is in the West somewhat? And it looks as if this is um, uh, more or less a script that has been written. Let's take, for example, the situation in Niger. It is now the fastest growing economy in Africa. Let's take, for example, the issue of their uranium, that one simple mineral, when they made a decision to start selling uranium to France and the rest of the world at 80 cents a kilo, that, I'm sorry, at 200 euro per kilo, from 80 cents a kilo, that immediately blew the Nigerian GDP close to 300 billion a year that one mineral alone now extrapolate it into the other minerals that have been exploited for centuries by the french now you see why niger which was considered the second poorest country in the world is now coming up to be the fastest growing economy in africa it doesn't take an albert einstein my son if Africa can be in control of Africa's resources, we map up our Africa and say gold mining is best in this region. Let's develop that industry and let's push our youth interested in mining. They can no longer be restricted to mining in Zimbabwe, to mining in Botswana only. They should be free to explore mining opportunity throughout the whole continent. Those who are interested in Asia, let's develop that industry. Let's hire the best and recruit and educate the best that we can have in agriculture. Because even if one small country can develop it, it just won't create enough jobs for the population that we have today. A structure that says we need to look Africans, the whole 1.4 billion. We look at the assets that we have. We look at the industries we developed. Why must we wait for Europeans to bring their mining expertise to Africa when we have an abundance of very capable and intelligent youth who could take care of this industry? So our failure, look at a global African continent come up with a global strategy on how to develop. My son, I don't have a pipe dream. Yes, it seems like a pipe dream, but if we have the right people in the leadership, we we'll simply say enough is enough. Why is it difficult for Africans to travel within Africa when foreigners have a carte blanche, red carpet to run around Africa? It is stupidious order. It's embarrassing talk about it. What is wrong with us? Why can't we take care of the obvious? Let's look at Niger and what Niger has done by simply saying, enough is enough. I am taking 
Nigeria's insanity once and for all. That's where we are as Africans. Your Excellency, um, many analysts hold that the West has always been maybe two, ten steps ahead of Africa in terms of strategy, the strategy you talk about. We can be, say literally we are at war, uh, but a different kind of war, a war of Literally. interests, a war of survival. So can we actually blame the West? Uh, looking at the, the, the situation on ground, um, reports say that depopulation is a new specter haunting the West. Uh, some conservative policy analysts fear that if fertility rates in, Af in America and Europe remain low as they currently are, the security of the West uh, may be jeopardized and in cultural influence undermined. And with a West that desires to remain um, its vice hold, so to say, on the continent, would it be right to say that there is a conspiracy, a strategy to ensure that this anomaly of brain drain continues on the continent? That's, that is nothing new, my son. They have been doing it uh, for centuries. Uh, remember, if I went to the creation of the uh, Britain Woods institutions, they were created three weeks soon after the Euro destroyed themselves during the Second World War. Those institutions were created with the best end that their is based on the failing developing nations. And so, particularly Africa, the world is looking at Africa. Make no mistake about it. Africa is the richest continent on earth, and I'm going to repeat that. Africa is the richest continent on earth, and the rest of the world is looking to get what we have. They've had a strategy. You're quite right. There are 10-year plans. There are 30-year plans, 50-year plans, 100-year plans are based on what they can get out of Africa. That is a fact, and they know it. The question is, do we know it? Do we have our own strategy to counter it? The problem is they are united in how they want to attack Africa and continue to exploit Africa. They are united in their strategy to exploit Africa. We, on the other hand, are still suffering from the Berlin Conference. We're still proud to be Kenyan. We're still proud to be Malawian. There is nothing wrong with that. But realize, that you are first an African. Secondarily, what place of birth you were. Are we prepared to unite as Africans? Is our leadership ready to unite as Africans, to finish that unfinished business that was started by our Pan-African fathers back in 1963? We, yes, the West has a blame to shoulder. They have set up this policy that must be dismantled. If you were to take, for example, <clears throat> the situation with loans to Africa, the average African country is paying some in excess of 60% of their GDP on loan repayment. That is simply not sustainable. How do you expect a country to grow? That's literally saying World Bank, IMF, they have their necks on many African countries, and they cannot breathe. With whatever breath those countries are left with, now we have to hold them accountable to say, OK, you don't have 80% of your breathing abilities, but with your 80%, 20% remaining, what have you done? Yes, you may have $100,000 as a minister of health. We want a hospital. Just show us one hospital. If you are Minister of Education, show us one school a year. So we take, we put blame where it belongs, but we cannot blanket and just say, well, we can't blame the West. Oh, no, 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 no. We have to blame the West because they are holding, they are at the core. So you can imagine if an African country was to suddenly stop paying the loans to the World Bank and IMF. Do you know how much money will come back to the coffers? If an African country can just take over its natural resources, just like Niger did, do you know how much that would buy GDP? So in terms of corruption, 
there's still going to be plenty left. I can tell you, my son, there's a lot more corruption taking place in the Western world. But because they have humongous GDPs that can absorb some of this corruption, you don't feel it. We must also expand economies. Let's like what is being siphoned out of our countries. We expand our GDPs. We expand our GDPs. We can remunerate people. And that's another way of cutting down on corruption. Some of the corruption we're dealing with in Africa is not just from the leadership. It's down to the workers. It's very difficult to get employees who are going to be honest. They will steal from you, from the top management, all the way down to the cleaner. <laughs> I can share with you a personal experience of a hostel that I ran, where who was cleaning, who was in charge of my housekeeping, she became the top supplier, cobra, cobra wax that's needed for the floor. What we were purchasing for the hospital, she was now selling it out. Next thing you know, she's putting in another invoice. This is in the hospital. They were eating patient food. When we were having food shortages and supplies were being given to services, it is the nurses who would take those essential services, food supplies, and feed themselves, their family and friends, and the little bit was left for the hospital. I can tell you stories upon stories where even workers themselves under themselves. So it's a culture that needs to change. Yes, we have responsibilities. At the company level, we must develop a culture of people who are going to be honest. But first and foremost, let's also remunerate them properly. When people are well remunerated, they are less likely to steal from the organization. You deal with that issue. Don't blanket the, the corruption at, an, at a company level to the rest of Africa. Then we go to the regional level, look at it from a district. What are the leaders of that district doing? Put the blame where it belongs. So at level, all the way to the government, all the way to the region, all the way to the African continent. Let's not blanket all of it with one individual, one organization. Every layer has its own set of issues that are addressed. And yes, corruption is an issue, but I truly believe... Indeed, Your Excellency, you, did answer, you actually answered my next question, talking about how Western policies have, have also contributed to driving economic migration on the continent. Um, according to a 2022 African Youth Survey, more than half of African youths aged between 18 and 24 are likely to consider immigrating uh, in the next uh, three years, if their governments do nothing to improve the quality of life. And as you said, with these policies um, really tightening or squeezing at the population with the IMF policies, one of them being uh, deregulation, also have a devaluation of the currencies, the buying power of, the, of, of the, uh, the populace is reduced, factories cannot function because of foreign exchange, the change in, you know, the lack of um, the power of the, the financial finance of the economy, and so many other policies are inimical to the growth of the economy. There's no way these countries can actually deliver uh, to their populace. So, and against that backdrop, why do these African leaders still go cap in hand to the IMF, knowing what is going to happen? Look at Nigeria, for instance. The nation keeps borrowing, keeps going back to the IMF and the reeling out policies that they must comply with. You know, and that's back to what I said when we started. It is absolutely mind boggling when you see inability as Africans to just come together and address this. The wrongs are so blatant, the harms so deep. How painful do the harms have to be before we can see the need to unite and speak with one voice? I'm going to use, for example, uh, and I keep talking about this, the United Nations uh, General Assembly, 
why do African leaders waste their time going there? Those entities were not created for us. Nothing there for us. We're not even at the table. What ministers of finance twice a year go to the bank. For what? Why can't they court? I can assure you, if Africa was to boycott the United Nations, Africa was to boycott IMF and World Bank and say, hey, we're not paying those loans anymore, I assure you, where all, all this has been paid for a thousand times over. Pay over. What is awesome. needed is a united Africa that speaks with one voice to challenge these international organizations and the policies that they have clearly designed to stifle Africa's development. Unity of purpose, the leaders must together and send one strong message. Boycott all these free, useless meetings with these international organizations. Africa does that for one month, two months, it will be over. But because we are not standing up and doing what most men would do, I do not see somebody like President Trump taking any of this nonsense from the rest of the world. No, that is wrong. Stop it. Plain and simple. I won't allow you to do it anymore. I know you have played this game for long. Stop it. That is all we have to do. But to succeed, the African leaders must come together and take that position together. We are All there. right, we hear you, Your Excellency. Indulge us in a moment. We'll take a break and take some messages. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Stay up to date with LN24-7. LN24-7. With news, politics, business, sports, and more on LN24-7. Where the story goes, we go. to date with LN247 LN247 with news politics business sports and more on LN247 where the story goes we go All right, welcome to the program. In case you just joined us, you're watching the agenda and we have been exploring the question of economic migration threats to Africa's demographic dividend and our talking points on the show have been do, does Africa Africa's population pose a threat to the West are Western policies driving economic migration and as we delve into the last but not the least examining Africa's youthful demographic edge our special guest on today's program is the uh, president and founder of the Af African Diaspora Development um, da Commission, and she joins us on today's program. She is Dr. Arikana Chihombori Kwao, and she has been sharing her thoughts and insights on these issues and quite insightful i must say um, don't forget you can also join the discussion sending your comments and contributions uh, to our platforms on x 
Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, including King's Chat. Yes, and we'll definitely get back to you on that. Well, examining Africa's youthful demographic edge, that is a critical issue. Now, before I do that, I'd like to hear what um, Her Excellency has to say about a comment that was made um, by, by someone um, saying uh, that um, African, African countries should be, um, should be recolonized because their leaders are corrupt. His name is Eric Prince. Eric Prince is a founder of U.S. private military arm Blackwater. For those who don't know Blackwater, as the United States, it is to the United States what Wagner Group is to Russia, mercenaries or hired guns. Uh, Prince is a former U.S. Navy officer, and in a brief clip, um, he posted on X by Africa Fact Zone expressed the opinion that African countries should undergo recolonization due to their leaders, perceived corruption and selfishness, suggesting that if African nations struggle with self-governance, it's time for them to be invaded once again. Quite um, quite um, provoking statement, uh, Your Excellency. Can you wade into this? <laughs> you know, I, I'm laughing because I, I'm reminded of a meeting President Trump had with African leaders uh, a few years back. And he specifically said, hey, I don't know why you guys are poor. My friends go to Africa poor and they come back rich. We do some of the most stupid things in Africa. The world is led us. Basic things, interventions that we could make that could change our economies overnight. I had to keep referring to Niger. In a few months, the country of Niger is turning itself around. Even the issues of terrorism, we have known for a long time that these are being funded national organizations that are coming to Africa in disguise claiming to be giving us aid. We do not need aid. All those organizations that are supposed to be bringing aid to Africa, I would say they need to get out of Africa ASAP. We don't need them. Their facets for fueling racism, facets for fueling instability, constantly interfering with the elections. We know this. Why aren't we kicking them out of our countries? So yes, I have to say, I don't agree with the general Africa must be recolonized, but what he is saying are facts that we must look realistic and then readdress the issue. Look at ourselves in the mirror and say, why are we doing this? We are making a mockery of ourselves as Africans. The world laughing at us, and I'm telling you from, from where I heard, from in, in staffers telling me, yes, we keep abusing you Africans because you let us. I attended a, a, a summit where it was a media summit, and one question was raised. Why do journalists always paint Africa negatively? and never highlight news out of And I still remember this CNN journalist got up and said, nobody, nobody stops us. Nobody stops us. That's how bad things are. We do not fight back. We do not push back. And then on top of that, we can't even take the basic issues, address the basic issues that in Africans. What, why is that? Why are we so in of addressing the basics? For heaven's sake, we need an African passport. Why is it so difficult for us to have an African passport so African children can move around and enjoy their Africa and not be humiliated from one border to the other while they're in their own Africa? We have a serious problem. And I can't help but think it goes back to the legacy of colonization. Too many of us in leadership are still suffering from the legacy 
of colonization. Well, Your Excellency, we, I do we, agree we with you that, that uh, such derogatory statements coming from Mr. Eric Prince uh, should be a wake-up call to our leaderships. It should be a wake-up call Absolutely. to Africans, um, despite the fact that such statements uh, should not be made. But looking at, we are on the home stretch now as we wind down, let's look at a call to action. Uh, you have been part of a lot of initiatives um, to stem this tide, this anomaly happening on the continent. Um, there are youths in this, on this continent who believe in the Africa that you preach. They believe that, that, you know, the grass is not greener on the other side. They're onto the game. Um, we have um, initiatives like you have supported, that, like the Future Africa Leaders Foundations. You have been a constant support. Uh, you came to Nigeria as a special guest at the uh, prestigious um, Africa, uh, Future Africa Leaders Awards, where young youths from all parts of the continent are doing great things, you know, to impact their sphere of influence and change the narrative. Do you think, what kind of impact do you think this kind of initiatives can make to change the dynamic? Let me tell you, that was an amazing program. The youth that Pastor Chris brought together were quite incredible. I had an opportunity to spend two hours with them. At the end of it, I left as a mother, a grandmother, I left with a warm and fuzzy feeling about our future. They were incredible youth. And so the work that Pastor Chris is doing, the leadership that he is uh, exemplifying, the students that he is pulling from all over the continent, we need more of that. We need to keep letting our children know that this is greenest in Africa. The world is looking at Africa for all their needs. So yes, to answer the initiatives that are being started by, through the New Africa Foundation and the great work that Chris is, we need more of those kind of leadership. leadership. We need more of the able people, financially wise, to and play your part in helping build our demographic dividend, which is our youth. I could not agree more that everybody able must up and do their part in developing our leaders of tomorrow who are our youth. You, you, did, uh, you have made reference in, in some of your submissions to the culpability of the African Union and over the years being more like a toothless bulldog, not having a bite. Um, it is, it, 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 in spite of the initiatives like um, the African Union's migration policy framework of uh, 2018 to 27, uh, making several recommendations which seem not have to be, uh, which seem like they've not been implemented. What do you think can more can be done to also enlighten our youths, make them stay back and, and work to build their countries, to build the continent? Well, it's, it's easier said than done. You can't just tell a young, young who is struggling to make ends meet to continue to stay in a country where they don't see any future for themselves. The opportunities are simply not there. But going back to uh, the issue of the African Union, African Union um, is a toothless bulldog. But part of it is because of leadership. We're now at the end of the second term of uh, uh, Chairman Musa Faki Mahamat who has been basically um, a dead horse uh, throughout his entire tenure. You don't hear a word out of him when African issues are raised. The African Union should be the voice for the Africans. See, the African leaders are sort of limited. An African leader can only speak to the issue to their country. They are very limited when it comes to speaking for the whole continent, because pretty soon you are going to be getting into some stuff. The voice of Africa must come out of the African Union, which is why when I read the article that um, uh, um, former Vice President Raila Odinga is looking for the African Union chair, we need Pan-Africanism. We don't need diplomats going to uh, AU anymore. We need ideological leadership based on Pan-Africanism. 
somebody who understands that Africa must be defended and protected any means necessary. Somebody who is fearless to call out those who are on the continent, those posts that are being thrown at Africa from a, from a level. A voice at the African Union that will go to those Western leaders and say, stop it. And when that leaves it, the leader must also support them in making sure that when they stop it, there are changes within those countries to support whatever is coming out of the African Union leadership. African Union inhaled the Africans. The African Union that our European fathers set out to create in, in 1963 failed dismally failed to deliver on their wishes and all because we chose to go slow and not follow that which the Casablanca had wanted and hoped for it was the creation of an Africa that spoke with one voice an Africa that was undivided but unfortunately that mission was, is yet to be accomplished. We need the proper leaders, proper leadership at the African Union. I'm hoping the next African Union chair is going to be a fearless Pan-Africanist who is gonna call it like it is and go after all these international leaders and policies that are detrimental to the continent. When we do that, you are now going to be talking about true Renaissance of Africa change is going to be brought by the people where people are going to be truly empowered the change desire. African Union has been a dismal failure that must change. Your Excellency, um, uh, before we go, the African Union uh, Summit, the 37th Ordinary Session in Addis is upon us. African leaders, despite what you have said, will be in high-level talks on institutional reforms. And its theme for this year is, is, is Educate and Skill Africa for the 21st Century. Well, can you set the agenda for that, for that uh, a session, for this session? Can you set the agenda of what should be discussed? You see, the issue with African Union is not a shortage of ideas. Lots of ideas, heads of states go to the Africa to discuss issues. It is the African Union Commission, which is led by Chairman Musa Faki Mahamad, that is responsible for implementation. That is where African Union failed. Implementation of the programs that the African heads of states would have spent hours debating and approving. I have been at the African Union on many occasions, Heads of states, I can tell you, they are working nonstop. I've had them for a meeting, an event in the evening that was supposed to start at 7, 8 p.m. They don't get out of their meetings until 2 a.m. and think they will cancel the meeting. They will show up at 2 a.m. and they will work. And if they have to work till 6 a.m., I've seen leaders do that. So I know the other leaders, they go to the African Union, they are doing their part. The problem implementation, the African Union Commission, which is the working organ of the African Union, where we have a dead horse. Implementation has always been the issue for the African Union. That needs to be addressed as a matter of agency. Your Excellency, I want to thank you for staying with us and thank you for joining us, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to share your thoughts with us on these issues. We've been speaking with Her Excellency, Dr. Arikana Chihombo Rikwao, and she is the president founder of the African Diaspora Development Institute. It's been a great pleasure having you on the agenda. Thank you so much, and uh, please keep up the good work. We appreciate and honor you.
Thank you very much. And so that's the way it has been on today's edition of the program. Uh, don't forget that uh, you can send your comments to us on all platforms and your contributions. We'd love to read them out and uh, definitely keep you posted. But one thing is, as, poet, as a poet and philosopher, Juan Wolfgang von Goethe said, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. And the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. My name is Henry Williams. Thank you for staying with us on the program. It's been great having you here. We look forward to seeing you same time on this station. Bye for now.